Go ahead and finish out with the P, Perseverance of the Saints. So I know Brother Dell mentioned that he wanted to look up in James White's commentaries and maybe his sermons and figure out exactly where James White was coming from on his angle of Calvinism. So I actually looked up Jeff Durbin and uh, kind of did the same. I, I said, you know, I've heard our side of the story plenty of times and uh, what do they have to say about perseverance of the saints? And so I looked up Jeff Durbin and I found a, a full length sermon. It was 53 minutes long. I said, great, all right, I'm gonna be able to listen to this whole thing and find out exactly where they're coming from. And it was part seven of a seven part series entitled Calvinism, Perseverance of the Saints. Uh, you can watch it yourself. I don't recommend it. It was very boring. February 28th, 2017. And, uh, you know, I really was hoping to get a lot out of that so I could figure out where they come from. But to be honest, he spent the first 40 minutes of his 53 minute sermon discussing all the previous four points of Calvinism. At the 40 minute mark, he goes into the P on Tulip and he starts talking about perseverance of the saints. And then he goes on to another bunny trail, rabbit trail. It gets, he used three, three references. He used uh, Matthew 24, uh, Jude, and uh, uh, 1 John chapter 2. And that was it. And then he started wrapping it up and I was like, ah, I just wasted all my time. So uh, we're going to cover those three tonight and a few more and uh, look into what Calvinism teaches. And, and this is the one, this is the point that a lot of people will say, hey, you know, this is probably the one that's most in line with traditional Christian values and norms and what we believe. And a lot of people will confuse it with once saved, always saved. That's not what Perseverance of the Saints teaches. And um, I want to go through that tonight. I remember when I came out of my former church, I was raised Pentecostal since I was a kid, and I spent the first you know, 30 years of my life there. And um, when I listened to Pastor Anderson's sermon on Once Saved, Always Saved, it hit me like a ton of bricks, and I believed faith alone in Jesus Christ from that point forward. Never doubted my salvation since. And, uh, but I was still in that church with my family and um, my parents. And during the adult Sunday school uh, Bible study one morning, I, you know, I kind of raised my hand. And I said, hey, we kind of believe that we're saved by grace through faith, right? And they're like, yeah. Well, if we don't do anything to get saved, do we have to do anything to stay saved? And that raised a huge little mini debate inside of that Sunday school class. I looked over and I saw the pastor's wife making a little note. And I saw it and she kind of just put it in her purse and I said, I'm going to hear about this. At the time, I was a deacon in the church. And so the next morning, I got a phone call from my pastor. Hey, Jake, uh, what you doing for lunch today? Oh, boy. <laughs> Oh, uh, nothing. I'm free. He's like, oh, let's go. Uh, let's go meet up at Olive Garden. Okay. So we walked into the Olive Garden and uh, he asked the, uh, the hostess to please sit us in the back corner away from everybody else. I said, oh, man. <laughs> 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 so for the next about hour and a half, he proceeds to tell me why I'm wrong and that, you know, a person can walk away from Christ and they can lose their salvation and blah, blah, blah. And he did not persuade me. I was fully convinced otherwise. And we butted heads. And ultimately, that's what led us out of that church. And we went seeking uh, a new uh, church. And I knew, hey, we need to go and become Baptist. Not Pentecostals, Baptist. Well, have you ever been driving down the highway? And as you're driving down the road, you might get off on the curb a little bit. And so you, you overcorrect and you go all the way to the other side. That's what we did. Instead of being Pentecostal, we jerked the wheel and we became Primitive Baptist. <laughs> well, I don't think we ever became Primitive Baptist because it wasn't too long before we realized, oh boy, this is Calvinism. And I didn't even understand what it was, but this was not jiving. And the longer we stayed there, the more we realized what we had been learning from the Bible and from Pastor Anderson's preaching and everybody else. This is anti Biblical. This is Calvinism. And um, so thank God we ended up here. So 
uh, I want to preach on the the P, the, the final point in Calvinism, the perseverance of the saints. And uh, if, a, if a Calvinist is being honest with you, um, they will admit to you that they know they're saved because of their changed lifestyle. That they, they used to do these things and now they no longer do them. And that is evidence of their salvation. And yes, believing is a big part of that, but they say that they're, sta they're saved because of um, pretty much their actions. I got a quote from uh, Jeff Durbin's little sermon. Uh, I, I made sure I paused it and I took my time and wrote it out and didn't want to misquote him. But uh, around the 48 minute and 30 second mark, he says, the proof that you have been justified is not that one time you believed. The proof is that you are believing now. And he says, have you repented in the past? And are you continually repenting now? And you know, what they believe, when they say repenting, that means turning from your sins. That's what they believe repentance is. And um, it's, it's, it's wild. But they, they expect you to continually to serve faithfully until your dying day. It says, uh, I had to go to Ligonier Ministries, R.C. Sproul's website, and he had this to say. It says, Those who do not show any desire to resist sin and pursue a love, uh, I'm, so, I'm sorry, and pursue a life of loving discipleship should have no confidence that they belong to Christ. Be encouraged that you are in Christ if, be encouraged that you are in Christ if you are striving against sin and endeavoring to live faithfully for Him. That's how you know you're saved if you're a Calvinist. So, anyways, we're in a, Matthew chapter 24, right? So uh, this is the first point, and this is the main point. For perseverance of the saints, it's Matthew 24, and they have just a, a mixed up view on end times biblical prophecy. Uh, Matthew 24, the key verse that they look to is verse 13. It says, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Well, when they see that word end, they think it's to the end of the Christian's life. To the individual's life but if you're looking at Matthew chapter 24 it says uh, just look down at verse 3 and it says and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives the disciples came unto him privately saying tell us when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world the end there we're talking about end times not the end of a Christian's life we're talking about end times. And look down in verse 6. It says, and Jesus is talking and he says, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. We're still talking about end times, okay? And so verse 13, it brings it up again. It's sandwiched in the middle of all this. This is their key verse. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And verse 14, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. And look down at the verse 22, skipping on down. Jesus wraps this up and says, And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. The end is the end times, the end, the rapture, and all that stuff, the day of the Lord. Now, we're talking about a physical salvation. When it says, no flesh shall be saved, we're talking about a physical salvation. So if you can endure into the end through the tribulation, and you can go that, that period of time without getting your head lost, you'll be saved physically by the coming of Christ. And you will never taste death in this life. That's what this is saying. It has nothing to do with... Stay, staying faithful to Christ and serving uh, until your dying day. Please turn to uh, 1 John chapter 2. This is the other verse that Jeff Durbin went to in his sermon. Uh, 1 John chapter 2. While you're turning there, I'm going to read you the last verse he used, which was uh, Jude. There's only one chapter in Jude, but verse 24 and 25. G, uh, Jude says, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy.
To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever, both now and ever. Amen. So he's talking about Jesus can keep you from falling, and they're talking about a, a physical life. Well, amen. I believe that too. If you think, um, you know, whatever your situation is, you just you're hopeless. You can't turn yourself around. At the end of the day, you're saved. If you believe on Jesus Christ, there's no pit so deep you can't climb out of. Right. And at the end of the day, you got eternal life to look forward Amen. to. So they're just, they're just mixed up on this verse. But they're trying to use it to say that if you're truly saved, you're never going to stumble and not get back up again. You know, the righteous man falls seven times, but he keeps getting back up. They'll say, well, you're never going to just be down and out and never get back up. Well, yeah, you can. Uh, a Christian can come to the point that it get, becomes so hopeless, he might even take his own life. Right, right. And, and we believe that someone who commits suicide, if they're saved, going straight to heaven. Right. Now, obviously, suicide is a terrible way to end your life. It's not what God has planned for you. And uh, I think, you know, it's one of the most selfish things anyone could ever do. Uh, you're robbing your children of a, of a, of a, of a parent and a spouse of a... Of a, of a spouse so you know that you are on this life to shine a light for Christ and if you extinguish your own light that's the worst thing you could ever do so don't take that as suicide as, a, as an option viable option first John 2 19 it says they went out from us but they were not of us for if they had been of us they would no doubt have continued with us but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were all not of us. Now, all these verses that Jeff Derva was reading, I didn't pick up what version he was reading. It was some Mickey Mouse version. It was not King James English. Uh, it's definitely false version for sure. But he tries to say that if somebody backslides and falls out of church, it just goes to show that they were never saved to begin with. That's the point he was trying to make. Well, I guess Solomon was never saved right. there. King Solomon, the man who next to Jesus Christ was the second wisest person to ever walk the face of the earth. You know, he, he wrote the book of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, the Song of Solomon. You know, he, he's, but at the end of his life, he had a thousand, you know, different wives and concubines mixed up. And his wives turned his heart from the only true God to devils and to idols. And he ends up serving uh, Baal at the end of his life. Right. A Calvinist would look at King Solomon and say, well, I guess he was never saved. Right. Yeah. That's just ludicrous. Yeah, right. You know, what about um, King Saul? You know, I don't, I don't believe that King Saul, uh, I don't believe that God chose King Saul, uh, an unsaved man, to be the ruler of all Israel. No, I believe King Saul was definitely saved. And we know that the night before his death, he visits the witch of Endor and she calls up Samuel and Samuel says, Tomorrow thou and thy sons will be with me. Right. And where was Samuel? Heaven. Samuel was in heaven too. Saul, you know, uh, you know, look at the, the end of Samson. He, he ends up committing suicide. Uh, look at about you know, uh, uh, 2 Timothy 4. Demas hath forsaken me. You know, Paul is saying, Demas hath forsaken me, and loving this present world. You know, so yes, a Christian can definitely backslide, and they can go so far as to commit suicide or worship, the, <laughs> worship Baal, and they're still going to be up in heaven. You know, Paul Washer says, there's no such thing as a carnal Christian. What an idiot. Um, but, you know, Calvinists like to throw this in our face. Soul winners, correct me if I'm wrong. They'll say this. You mean to tell me that someone who was eight years old that said a prayer, you know, and they, they just live their life however they want to and they're wicked, wicked and ungodly and they don't have any desire to serve Christ. You're trying to tell me they're going to be in heaven one day? Well, that's kind of a sneaky question. Yeah, right. Because, for one thing, someone who says a prayer doesn't automatically make them say. That's right. You know, Brother Fannin used Romans 10, 9. Romans 10, 9 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So, just say it a prayer alone is nothing if you don't believe what it is, you know, what you're putting your faith in. And so, to answer their question, well, if they truly believed, yes, they're saved. If they truly believed, I don't care what they're up to these days. You might not can see anything. It's like this. If you walk up to a bum on the street and he's drunk and, you know, you can just tell this guy is in a bad way. And you said, hey, are you 100% sure if you die today you're going to heaven? Yes, sir. 
I am. What makes you think so? I believe on Jesus Christ for my salvation. Really? Anything else? Nope. There's nothing else you can do to earn your salvation. It's only through Jesus Christ and His shed blood. He paid for all my sins. He's God in the flesh. That's what I believe. That's what I've always believed. And you can just go out and live a wicked, sinful life? He's like, I'm living the worst kind of life you could ever imagine. Wow. I would walk away from that guy saying, that dude's going to be in heaven one day. But I could walk down the street and knock on the door of a Calvinist and I can say, are you 100% sure you're saved? Well, uh, I am. I am. Uh, what makes you think so? Well, I do pretty good works and I'm in church all the time. And, you know, I'm a part of James White Mellon list and everything else. And, uh, you know, and, uh, and he can quote me all these different scriptures, obviously with a, probably a wrong version. Yeah. He can quote all these Bible verses. I would walk away saying that fool's going straight to hell. Amen. So, you know, it's, 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 it is our words that justify what you believe. You can't see someone's works. You can't see their deeds and say that person's justified in the sight of God. You can only tell by what they believe by their faith. And, and, and the Calvinists mix up faith and works and grace. They, they mix it all up. So they say that God gives you the faith. Wrong. God doesn't give us the faith. He gave us the grace if we put our faith in trust in Jesus. Right. And everybody has faith. I've always said that. Everyone has faith. Even an atheist has faith in something. And on the deathbed of an atheist, he is truly hoping there is no God. Yeah. That is his, he is saying, don't let there be a God on the other side of this life because he knows he's messed up. He knows he didn't believe in, the, in, in when he had the opportunity. So everyone has faith. It's what you choose to put your faith in is whether you're justified. So, and uh, just skipping along, I'm kind of getting into a, I'm running out of time here, but, uh, you know, there's, uh, uh, we don't believe in the, persever uh, the perseverance of the saints that if you're truly saved, you will serve God faithfully for the rest of your life. You should do that, but you're not commanded to to stay saved, and it doesn't prove that you are saved. You know, Judas, I look at his life, and he, he was a disciple of Christ up until the end, and uh, he's burning in hell right now. And, and I tell people this, Judas, Judas could have betrayed Christ and still went to heaven if only he believed. That's right. You know, yeah. there's, they, you, you, Judas didn't just go to hell because he betrayed Christ. Judas went to hell because he never believed. So, um, we don't believe in the uh, perseverance of the saints. We believe in the preservation of the saints. Once you're saved, you're always saved, no matter what. And witnessing to a Calvinist is very frustrating. It's very frustrating. But uh, at the end of the day, they're still people. And we still need to have a heart for them. Yeah. And the more we can learn of their doctrine, the, the sharper we're going to be, the better we're going to, the more equipped we'll be in order to, to shine the gospel, the true gospel, to a Calvinist. So uh, that is my prayer today. And um, let's go ahead and wrap it up with prayer dear lord we thank you for this day we thank you for um, allowing us to to cut through calvinism with the the pure words of christ with the sword of the lord we just thank you for giving us um, a sound mind and lord we ask that you soften the calvinist heart so when we come to them we can we can come to them in a loving way that they'll see us as a friend and someone who honestly cares about their soul Please equip us, Lord, and allow us to shine the light wherever we go and to win the Calvinist to Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.